In this lecture, we will continue with file system fundamentals. Previously, we introduced data forensics and we also defined computer systems for forensics examinations. In this course, we will explain how to store information in a computer and uh, how files work internally. And then we will explain the file headers. Then we switch to the hardware part and explain how storage works how to store files in a storage, and uh, finally, merging them, uh, we define what is a file system, and we also define some internals, explain some internals of how file systems work. Uh, finally, we will finish this lecture uh, by uh, examining, uh, exemplifying uh, some file systems that are out there. First, let's start with how to store information in a computer. Uh, most of the people at least heard or know that files are stored in ones or zeros in a computer. But what they actually mean? Most of the time, uh, when you store data in a computer, you have either some electrical current or a magnetic field or not. And you just refer one of them as one and the other one as zero. For example, you may say, if the magnetic field is in that direction, I accept it as one and the other direction should be zero. If you see that there is an electrical current in some circuit, you say, I accept it as one and the if there is no electrical current and I accept it as zero. Actually, this means you have some kind of uh, state information that you can put all together. For example, if you have just one circuit like that, you either have electricity or not, and then at the end you can define two different states with this one, the one with the electrical current and the other one without the electrical current. If you have two of the circuits, then you can define four different things. For example, you can have electrical current in one of the circuits and the other one may have two different states. And again, for the other state in, the, in your first electrical circuit, you can define two others for the second circuit. So you end up with four different states. Putting all these circuits right next to each other, you can define <clears throat> lots of states and you can just say uh, by referring them as numbers. This leads to binary uh, numbering system and this binary numbering system is capable of defining any number, any integer number. This integer numbers then represented to some data we know of. For example, you can just say, uh, I will accept letter A as one and letter B as two and letter C as three and so on. You can also assign some punctuation marks or some other comments uh, just by encoding them into this binary numbering system. All you need to have is you need to have some kind of table and you need to check what each state means, what each binary number means for you. Uh, and if you also put these tables in, within your own computer, you can actually start to use these uh, semantic meanings of encodings with your computer, for example, when the computer sees a tree, it prints the letter C, so you can actually uh, start to use this uh, information within your computer. And let's think about files. There are several bunch of types, uh, files. Uh, for example, think about uh, just pure text file. Uh, not a formatted document, uh, I don't mean a PDF file or, or, or a Word file, but just the pure text file. 
uh, in this pure text file, you just store letters after letters. So you define some kind of boundary, let's say eight bits, which means you put eight electrical circuits next to each other. Uh, you just say eight bits is enough to define a letter or a punctuation mark or anything else. So you say, okay, with eight bits, I can define up to 256 different states and I will assign one letter for each of them. So I can define a whole lot of letters, numbers, exclamation marks, commas and dots and so on. And if you have this structure, you just put encodings of each letter one after another and you end up with a file because if you just convert this 8-bit pieces to a letter right after another, uh, actually you can print the whole text file. This is what we actually do in our computers when we use, for example, if you are using a Windows operating systems, when you use a notepad. Uh, all you need for your computer, all, all the computer needs to know is just the table that assigns numbers to letters. And something like that is also uh, true for other file types. But in the other file types, you may need some kind of extra formatting. For example, uh, if you would like to define a picture, let's say a bitmap file, what you need to do is you define how many colors, uh, what, what should be the intensity of colors in each small square that we call pixels. For example, for each pixel, most of the time, uh, you define three different colors, red, green, and blue, and you define the intensity from 0 to 255, which makes a total of 256 states. So for eight, each 8 bits, you define one color, red, green, and blue. If you have the most intensity for all three of them, you end up with white. Uh, if you just... Uh, define intensity of red as 255 and the other zero, you end up with a pure red square. And if you set everything to zeros, then you end up with a pure black square. And when you put all these squares right next to each other, you end up building a picture. But there is a trick. Think that uh, you would like to define bitmap picture with 10 pixels width and 10 pixels height. In that case, the computer should know where it should break the lines. So in the beginning of the file, you should also say that, okay, I have two different states. And one of the state is defining the width of the picture and the other one defines the height of the picture. If the computer knows that, it can easily divide after each line. So after visualizing 10 pixels right next to each other, the 11th one should be placed in the beginning of the second row and you can actually display the whole picture. Uh, for WAV files, for example, uh, the voice files, most of the time, you define just one intensity for the amplitude of the voice or, or the sound in general. Uh, but you have thousands of sampling points make in a second. For example, most of the time you do 44,000 samples every second to be able to uh, store and encode uh, the sound and also this is uh, very close to the actual sound that we can hear uh, with a file. For all different file types, uh, just like Word files, doc files and uh, or, or PDF files or executables, most of the time 
you have some kind of structure within this file. Sometimes, it is very rare, but programmers may want to uh, build up their own files and they define the structure of the file and they use it. But this is rare. The reason is standardization. People would like to generate a file and then transfer it to some other computer and the other computer should be able to understand it. Uh, imagine you built your own encoding for text files, but you didn't supply the table that converts numbers to letters. It's a mess. You cannot use it anymore. So that's why file standardization is important. Uh, for this standardization, most of the time we use file headers. File headers include information about the file, its contents, uh, sometimes the size of the file, or for example, uh, when we actually exemplify a sound file, something like a WAV, you say, I have uh, 1,000 sampling points, or 8,000 sampling points, or 44,000 sampling points each second. Uh, actually, even if you don't dis define this in the beginning of the file, uh, the computer is not capable of producing the same sound again. The reason is very simple. Uh, if you have 10,000 samples in one of the files and 5,000 samples in one of the files, if you try to play the 5,000 sample file uh, as 10,000 sample file, you will end up with a very speedy sound that it will be just squeezed into half of the length of the duration of, of the sound file, the original sound file, and you, you, will, you will not actually uh, hear what is said. Uh, so you need to know some kind of characteristics of file. Uh, again, as I give the example previously, uh, you need to know the height and width of the image file, for example. Or if you are trying to use some kind of document file, you may want to know the alphabet that's in use beforehand. So the file headers are made for that. They have standard names most of the time. Uh, for example, each bitmap image starts with a B and M, capital B and capital M letter, for example. The text file, most of the time, doesn't have any kind of header so you just accept it as it is by using the tables already installed within your computers. So this is the files and how we define files within files itself. So we have the file headers and the relevant information. So we have this bunch of information put in a structure order. This is what we call a file. Now let's go back to the hardware part and try to define how storage works. Uh, actually, I have mentioned this already. There are many different types of storages, like the early punch cards. Uh, you can define a state. Uh, either there is a punch in the card or not. Or there are tape drives. Uh, you may think of CD-ROMs. And most obviously, the most common one is the hard disk drives. In the hard disk drives, you have a plate that is magnetically activated and enabled. So you can actually change uh, the magnetic field of each small, uh, let's say, field, each small surface area on that plate. Uh, and what you need to do, the, the what the hard disk do when you try to store some data on it is it just accepts one of the directions for the magnetic field as one and the other one as zero. And when you write the file, it, file, it finds a proper place for your file and then tries to change the magnetic field of that area by making some kind of magical electromagnetic tricks, let's say. And whenever you need to read it, uh, you go to the same place on that magnetic plate and try to read the magnetic field using some kind of 
very basic magnetic sensors, like very, very small uh, magnets, you may think. Uh, we have this structure, so if you have a plate, actually you have uh, cylinders, inside cylinders, and uh, at each point on this uh, <clears throat> Uh, on this uh, circular areas, you you are trying to find one magnetic field, or you are reading it as not activated uh, already. But you would like to read this specific part, or read uh, or write to that specific part. Uh, imagine that you have just one file in your file system and it doesn't have any header information or nothing else it's it's just you are just trying to store uh, a piece of very long text what you do is you put eight bits of information for each letter so actually for each letter you need to change the magnetic field uh, of eight uh, neighboring squares on your hard disk plate and for the next letter you do again and again and again but imagine you have a text file and you would like to go back and change one line or you would like to insert something what could you do in that case I mean you need to go back and write over all the file again because actually you are somewhere in the middle of the file and if you insert something you need to move all of the magnetic fields right next to each other. You don't want to do that. Uh, as a result, we end up with something like uh, structured storage devices. Most of the time, when you use a hard disk, you find, so you define some kind of space like, okay, I would like to spare this 10,000 squares that I can write into as one block and the other as another block. So I will always start, try to store my files in the beginning of a block and if there is some empty space at the end of the block, I keep it for future use. So I can just move a little bit of data and then I can insert my new text in the middle, so it could be easier than trying to relocate all data on the <clears throat> hard disk. Again, this is not actually very nice because uh, if you would like to add more data that could not fit into one block, then you need to uh, try to, you need to move all block from one location to another location and add the rest uh, into the second block, which is not very nice actually, which is not usable. As a result, you end up with the idea that, okay, it is nice that I can keep one file just for the structure of the disk. It will be structured as a table and I will just write the file names in that table at one side and the other side will include the uh, block that I will use, uh, that I should go and <clears throat> search for the contents of the file. Again, if you have more than one block in your file, uh, if your file is bigger than one block, then you need to add more blocks on that table. So, so the right side of the table is not actually including just one block, but a series of blocks. So when you read and write and read and write and read and write your data on the hard disk, uh, at some point, uh, the neighboring of or the spatial locality of these files, of these blocks, uh, are got ruined because you delete one file and then you try to override another one and then you try to insert something in between. And all the time, you need to keep track of all these changes in the table, and you end up uh, with a three block size file. Uh, it starts with the 12th block, then continues in the fifth block, 
and then continues in the ninth block. It, it is not nice because you need to find that place first to read information every time you need to read data and it slows your computer down. To solve that from time to time, your operating system finds all these data that, could, that should actually logically uh, get together, that should follow each other, and they replace them. This is called defragmentation. I don't know if you ever heard, uh, but if you use this defragmentation, the reading time of your files could be apparently faster, and most of the time you don't need to do anything for this. Your operating system just manages this, and let's say every one month uh, they do some kind of defragmentation for you. Now we say uh, actually how file systems exist and how they work. They actually have, in the simplest scenario, one table that keep all the files, names, and their places. So your computer could go to that place on your hard disk and try to read the contents from the magnetic field. Everything's fine. Uh, I would like to... Uh, in the next lecture, we will actually go into depth of this file system structure, but I would like to mention some file systems that are already out there. A very widely known file system is FAT family of file systems, FAT12, FAT16, or FAT32, uh, and also you may include XFAT, EXFAT, to this one. FAT stands for File Allocation Table. This is actually the table I am mentioning uh, right now. So it keeps track of the places of all the files in your system where they reside. Uh, FAT family of file systems are usually used uh, in the early Microsoft operating systems uh, and we are still using them for small devices like USB sticks. They keep track of files uh, uh, in a, and actually they have some kind of limitation of the file size and also the maximum storage you can use with this file system because it is how big your table is. Uh, as a result, uh, these File systems are not suitable for current operating systems, but they are still suitable for small USB sticks and so on. Uh, this is a very basic file system, so uh, it is very fast uh, and practical most of the time. And this file system is uh, recognized by nearly all operating systems, including Linux, uh, MacOS, and Windows family. Uh, so it is the most obvious choice for if you don't care about extra functionality. Then we have another file system, uh, let's say NTFS. It includes a very interesting, uh, a very interesting set of features. Like you can now set uh, user access permissions, and you can define larger files, and you can use larger storages, and you can have some extra logical features about your hard disk. Uh, probably, if you don't go into details, you don't need to know. Uh, this is the most obvious choice for today's uh, concurrent operating systems, uh, concurrent Microsoft operating systems. Uh, a similar operating systems from Apple is HP, uh, HFS or HFS Plus or APFS. These are standing for hierarch hierarchical file system, hierarchical file system plus or Apple file system. They have more or less the same functionality. You hardly notice the difference uh, as a user in the, uh, in between NTFS and uh, HFS. Uh, but these file systems are not interoperable. For example. Uh, a Windows operating system will not recognize uh, HFS directly. You need to do some kind of tricks. You need to install some additional software or so on. And another one 
uh, we should mention, I think, is the ext family of file systems. The final one is ext4. Uh, this is uh, the extended file system uh, for Linux machines. Uh, and they have permission functionality. They have some features for the stability of your computer. And this is, again, uh, hardly interoperable. And if you have a hard disk using X4, for example, uh, you need to take extra actions to recognize it to uh, Apple MacOS uh, computer or a Windows operating system. I think that's all for this lecture and we will continue with advanced file systems uh, in the next lecture. Goodbye.